I will now welcome my next speaker, Lucas Letters from Aurelis. Um, and considering I myself live in Berlin, I'm very grateful that he is here today and for the work he does, because he will be speaking about using AI to prevent residential burglary in Berlin. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. So maybe we wait a second before all people that come go out and come in are back. While we are waiting, ah, I have no screen. I have it only there. Yeah, I created a picture for this with Dolly. I think it was in the keynote this morning, and um, yeah, it looks like it look, look, really looks like a real picture of a burglar entering a building. So, a warm welcome to everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's been a long time standing in, in front of so many people. Um, in this session, we are talking about using AI to prevent residential burglary in Berlin. Um, for all of you maybe not familiar with the term, residential burglary means um, Wohnraum Einbrüche. Um, for me, this was a little bit new. Um, yeah, my name is Lukas. Um, I'm a senior data scientist. I work for a company called Aurelis. Maybe not all of you know them because, yeah, in this case, maybe a small introduction of us. We deal with all of this topic that are discussed today, um, from data engineering, data platforming, business intelligence, um, business analytics, and obviously artificial intelligence. Um, to save some time, I think I would skip this, maybe just for information, we are sitting in Düsseldorf at the airport, and we are Microsoft partners, so um, we do most of our projects in the Microsoft technology space. Um, two of my colleagues are here, also in the audience, I think. Um, so if you have any questions about that or the project, don't dare to ask. Okay, let's jump right into the topic. Um, I brought you a little chart about the residential burglaries in Germany over time. And as you can see, there is a peak in 2015. So there was a 60% increase in burglaries um, over time. As you can see, the numbers are dropping, so things are getting better. Um, but during this time in 2015, there was a lot of let's say, media, hype, newspaper articles about this topic. I brought you some of these um, from very different papers. Um, there was a lot of political interest in this topic. Maybe some of you remember that this topic was even um, f relevant for the election. I'm from Northern Westphalia, and I still remember the, the posters, um, the election posters with the topic burglaries. But we are here to talk about Berlin, so I brought you the numbers for of Berlin. And in this case, we can see that Berlin was ahead of its time because the peak was a little bit earlier in 2012. But as you can see, they have a really huge increase in numbers, 95% um, in six years. And um, because of this public awareness of the topic in 2015, there was a decision to start a project to have a look if there are methods to yeah, predict this kind of crime, this kind of residential burglaries. And um, yeah, maybe just for reference, there are 33 burglaries per year during this time. So it's quite a high number. For, for comparison, cities like Chicago have, I think, around about 63 burglaries per day, and they have a, overall a much higher crime rate. So, um, yeah, Berlin was really, um, like I said, ahead of its time. So, to understand what we have done in this project, there's one important theory to know. Um, it's well researched, it's called the near repeat theory. Um, I will read it, otherwise, I always forget something. So, the near repeat theory suspects that organized crime will be repeated in the same area several times before the perpetrator moves on. So, what does it mean? There are two kinds of criminal activity in the area of burglary. The first one is a sponta spontaneous one. So someone, I don't know, sees an open door, goes in, grabs the laptops, goes out. Um, obviously, for predicting these kind of things, we would need a glass ball or a mystical glass ball um, because it's some kind of ad hoc, spontaneous, that's not possible um, to predict. But there are a lot of crimes in this area that are done through or by organized groups, people, however, and these people or these organized groups, um, they scout areas, they 
have a look, how can we escape? So they do a lot of preparation. And when they do this, they, there is a chance that there's a pattern. So maybe they start in one part of the town, look around, do some burglaries, and move on to the next. So, this, so the theory can be used, um, if this is true, to predict the next burglary. And yeah, if it's possible to predict it, then the police maybe can take preventive action. So that's the theory behind it. And like I said, we have done this project with the LKA of Berlin. And yeah, the idea is to catch the perpetrator or to drive them off. What's the most, uh, yeah, catch I think will be the better case, but it's quite hard in the reality. So how did we do it? Um, like the topic of this talk that is about AI. So we created a grid, a grid of 5,000 quadrants 400 by 400 meters that we laid over Berlin. Um, looks like this, but the quadrants in reality were a little bit smaller. Um, and as you can see, yeah, then we use this grid to train a machine learning model. So we do predictions for every quadrant. There are other approaches, um, doing more better fitting uh, quadrants, more following the street line, but in this case we decided we just use um, symmetrical quadrants. And maybe to give you some information about the model and the data that we used, um, the first thing, the whole solution is hosted on-premise. So no cloud, no, no, nothing, just on-premise. Um, all the data preparation is done in SQL, in a SQL database. And <laughs> the most crazy part, the machine learning is done on a computer or server with two cores and 16 gigabytes of RAM. So no deep learning, no Kubernetes, no nothing. I think the most of the laptops in this room are more powerful than the machine that we used at this time. Um, how is it possible? If you, for example, use four years of training data, then you have around about 50,000 crimes during that time. And yeah, so you have 50,000 observations. If you take every quadrant every day for the training, you have around about 7.3 million observations for training. And that's no problem for even a laptop. We didn't use a laptop, but in theory, the, the number of data is not that big. We calculated two kinds of models. The first one is a serial crime model. So we try to um, identify if a crime belongs to a serious, why is it important? Organized crime often is a serious crime. And how do we do this? Yeah, obviously we used information about the crime, for example, the modus operandi. So how did the perpetrator get in? Um, what kind of goods have they stolen? At which point in time? And so on. Um, and we use this information for yeah, creating then the burglary model on this quadrants that you have seen um, for the next 72 hours. So that's always the time frame that we're looking at. If you want to know more about the data later on, you can uh, scan this QR code. You will go to fragdenstaat.de. So because of the <laughs> Informationsfreiheitsgesetz, um, you can ask the police everything and they have to answer. And someone asks, what kind of data did you use for this model? So if you're interested in it, it's all public. <laughs> but I brought to you a little extract that, so that you have an idea what's inside. Um, the first thing is obviously how many burglaries did happen in the past in this quadrant or in the neighboring quadrants, how many of these were serial crimes, um, quality of housing, distance to the next autobahn, how crowded is the place at night, and all this information can be found in the data warehouse of the LKA Berlin. So, yeah. The most important <laughs> message here, there is no personal data used in this model. There was a big discussion in the media, documentation, movies sometimes, um, where people have the fear of civilian state um, monitoring everything. I can say that is not the, not the case here. It's not like in Chicago or London where people are tracked by cameras and so on. So it's, it's for me it's okay. So I think for, for the most of you it will also be okay. I'm quite um, cautious in this case. So, how, what does the, to the tool do? The tool creates this kind of maps or heat maps here. And as you can see, this is, is one day in 2020, 2021. And um, yeah, obviously a red area is a more endangered area and a yellow one is a 
yeah, less endangered one for burglaries, there is no chance of zero. <laughs> so um, only the areas that have no color, there's nobody is living there. So for example, uh, Tempelhof Airport, there nobody, nobody is living there. So this map is interesting for analysis, but it's not very useful for operative use. Because the idea is that the police officers can go to an area where burglaries are going to happen, probably. So we got that, we started to forming clusters. And building this cluster was <laughs> a big part of the project because it's not so easy to find good clusters that are usable for, um, by, or that are usable for patrolling and so on. The worst case was this one, it's not exactly the same, but this was one of our first clusters. Um, yeah, obviously this area <laughs> at the size of more than 2,000 hectares, good luck with patrolling there and finding anybody. Um, so we needed to find smaller areas, something like this, that are capable of, or that one or two police officers can patrol more intensely to, for example, drive off perpetrators. And it's really this is something that really happens in, uh, in reality. So because of more presence on the street in these areas, um, offenders moved on to other areas or even to other cities. There are some, some cases where that actually is um, documented. Okay, so the last thing here that is important is <laughs> how, how to calculate a hit. So if you, if you want, we want the, I think uh, one hour ago there was a speech about measure, uh, how you can measure something. And in this case, it's important that the clusters that we find, that you have a hit there. So that you can say, okay, in 60% of our clusters, there is really a burglary happen. And this is a topic for itself, because it's quite, quite hard, um, or actually quite easy, to get to a hit rate of 100%. If you increase the size, or if you increase the time that you're watching it, so um, yeah, there's, there's really a scientific discussion about how to measure the hit rate here, but we'll leave it like this. Um, we have two hits on this map. <laughs> Maybe some information about the project itself. Um, it started in 2015 with some workshops, then moved on. Um, in August 26, in, in August 2016, in August 2016, um, Crimpro had his first release, so there was the first, um, yeah, the publicly released Twitter tweet about the project and it was used in operative use since that day. One year later, we started with improving the model, so better reports, better features, better, better, better. And um, to give you an idea how long does it, does it take to develop such a project, um, we worked there together with Microsoft and Overall, there was an amount of 100 days of development time from our side. There's a lot of more side invested by the police, obviously, but from a development perspective, it's not more than 100, year, uh, 100 days. Um, this is only possible because of the good quality of the data warehouse, so there wasn't so much data engineering needed. And today, the model is still in place. Still there, generating predictions every day for the police to patrol um, or to find or prevent burglaries. So, how good are the results? Um, Crimpro fulfilled the expectations. It's not perfect, it's just a tool, it is just a help for the police officers to use the, the police forces that they have more directed. It had a, in the beginning or in th 2018, it had a, a hit rate, so how, how good was the prediction of 60% 60 60 per day. And it outperformed every other approach that was known before. So for example, random, randomly picking an area or using police statistical models. And the only thing that we have done here is we use machine learning. <laughs> Um, another important topic, in the beginning 10 states started using or doing predictive policing for burglaries and nowadays only three are left. Northern Westphalia, Hessen and Berlin. All others stopped, stopped their initiatives or the projects we don't know, um, as far as I know. Um, what important here is that every of the surviving solutions are self-developed. 
in, in 2015, there was a discussion because there are some, or there were some proprietary vendors for this kind of software from overseas or from, from European um, neighbor countries. And there was a discussion if it's better to build or buy. And after some years, we can say building this important part by themselves was the better, the better approach for the Berlin police. And yeah, obviously the numbers declined because of Corona. <laughs> um, so the model lost a little bit of its relevance. It is still used every day. And if the numbers will go up again, um, yeah, CrimPro will be there. And yeah, it's still in use, but at the moment, burglaries is not the most important topic in our society, to be honest. Um, maybe six more little success factors that I identified backwards. The first thing that's really, really, really important here is the professional expertise that we build into the model. Um, I'm no crime expert. I don't know nothing about burglaries. So it is important that we have, that there were experts in this area, in this case, commissioners, police officers, and so on. Um, second factor I told you before is the good data quality. Without the data warehouse, it wouldn't be possible to do this project in this short amount of time. The third one, political support. This project would not have been possible without political support because, like I said, there was a little bit of a controversy or a, a discussion in the beginning. The things that for important, are most important for me personally is why this project maybe was an or isn't a success is that the solution is manageable by the LKA. Like I told you before, we had some kind of limited resources. And um, yeah, the LKA is possible to maintain and use this tool every day by themselves. They don't need expertise or a data scientist who is fixing the model every day. It just works how it is. And I never had an emergency call in all the six years that, oh, it's not working, Lucas. So that's quite okay. One more thing, transparency. Mm. It is very important, or it was very important for the police to have a model that is explainable. Other, because they, this topic is of public interest, and if they aren't able to explain why a decision was done, how it was done, um, there is a kind of problem. So a black box approach is, was not possible. So there was, a, in the beginning, we just used a decision tree, <laughs> and then we moved on to a small random forest, where we call it in the end it's still explainable, plus more um, things like we hear before, lime, chap, etc. But transparency for this kind of project is extremely important. And the last thing, yeah, we always kept our fat on the ground. <laughs> so it's nice to dream of cloud, deep learning, Kubernetes, I don't know. But in this case, this what, no, tech, the technical part is not important here. Important was the the effort to build a, a fitting model from the with the professional expertise of the um, police officers. So technic, I'm, the, I'm more a technical guy, but in this case, I must say that the expertise was the most important part here. So no need for deep learning or something. Um, if you want to learn more, more of the project, there's a QR code to the project. If you want to try it out on Chicago, this data is public, so I rebuilt something of it. That the other thing, you can have a look. And otherwise, I'm happy to hear questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Um, maybe we can have the microphone. Feel free to say your name and uh, where you're, which company you're from. The mic over there. Thank you. I'm Stefano from Datastax. Um, you mentioned trans transparency. So now uh, my question is, would you feel that if, you, if the project would not be, let's say, bound to be very explainable, very transparent, the performance would have been better, honestly? Like if you could use any black box approach, you could. Yes and no. I'm very sure that another algorithm would have done better predictions on the heat map. Um, uh, it's a long way back. So I think the heat map would have looked better. 
But the important part here is the clustering afterwards. So increasing the model performance by one or two percent makes no difference. Important is what you do with this prediction for operative use. So yes, I would like to have something different, maybe a booster or something. But um, yeah, the reality is um, I think it would not have made such a big difference. Thank you. My name is Igor Verga with Biterna. Um, are there any possible external data sources which could improve the whole model? Have there been any wishes from the police to, um, to improve the performance and yeah, to mm -hmm. get the burglars down? Um, yes, there is external data used actually. For example, um, I don't know where it's from, but it's like I said, crowded place at night. There's somehow some way this data is measured, so some streets are more crowded at night. I don't know how do they measure it. I think about with noise or something. Um, yes, so there are external data used, um, but there wasn't. I can't remember that there was a wish for more something like. I don't know, let's say the weather or something. What's uh, part of the model obviously is uh, the day of uh, the time in year. So in the winter, there are more burglaries and so on. But um, yeah, this obviously could be a potential um, improvement. But um, yeah, at the moment, there are exter is external data, but I think there could be a little bit more to do. Yeah. Uh, besides Berlin, are there any other cities which apply this model or? similar or more sophisticated, like real-time data, um, <laughs> usage or whatever? <laughs> as far as I know, not in Germany. Um, like I said, London and Chicago are a different uh, piece of cake. <laughs> um, they have much, much more data, the other approach. Um, so, no, I think, as I, I know this, this model, we tried it in Brandenburg, this model, um, but it didn't work so well in, in Brandenburg, this approach, because of the quadrants. Brandenburg had a lot of rural areas where this approach does not work. So they decided, they decided not to do this, and there were several other reasons, but they decided it. Um, in Northern Westphalia, they have a similar approach. In Hessen, actually, I don't know, they do it a little bit different. But um, in the background, there's always this near-repeat theory. So. The, uh, the idea that you can yeah, identify um, the next burglary by a pattern that the perpetrator is doing. Thank you. Like in the minority report or something like that. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm, a co I'm very cautious concerning um, surveillance state and so on, and I still sleep very well. <laughs> For me, that's more than fine. And like I said, everything is public. You can read it online on fragtinstaat.de. I think that's it. I think, yes, we're out of time, but I'm sure you will be here um, to answer questions. Thank you very much. I can tell you. <laughs> this